Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us today for this Ask the Mito Doc panel. We've got a great panel to answer your questions today. Joining us, Dr. Richard Bowles of Neurabilities Healthcare, based in New Jersey, but it does do telemedicine nationwide. And in his practice, Dr. Bowles focuses on several topics, including mitochondrial disease and dysfunction, and terms of designing DNA diagnostic testing and research projects. Dr. Annette Feigenbaum joins us from Rady's Children's Hospital in San Diego. She is a metabolic and mitochondrial disease specialist. And joining us is Dr. Fernando Scalia from Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Dr. Scalia's research focuses on clinical research on trials evaluating citrulline in adults with MELOS and children with mitochondrial epilepsy. He sees children and adult patients with mitochondrial disorders at Adult and Pediatric Mitochondrial Clinic. Dr. Irina Anselm joins us from Boston Children's Hospital. She is a child neurologist, and she is the director of the mitochondrial program at BCH for more than a decade. And from Baltimore, Maryland is Dr. Richard Kelly. Dr. Kelly is Professor Emeritus from the Kennedy Krieger Institute and the Department of Pediatrics and Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Re Kelly's research is focused on biochemical basis of genetic disorders. Now, before we begin, we want you to understand that Ask the Mito Doc is not a substitute for professional advice or services provided by your own personal physician. Information provided here today should be used as a conversation starter for your own personal physician. Panel, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. We've got a number of questions that have been pre-submitted for your consideration. And so we wanna get started. Time goes fast on these panels and we wanna make sure we get to everybody's question. We have gathered it into session topics and we hope we can get to all of them. So let's begin with diagnosis. And for that, I wanna start with Dr. Bowles. So doctor, what type of physician is the best one to go to for genetic testing? Well, I mean, genetic testing is extremely powerful. I've used it you know, for decades now, and through the last five years, at least, it's been my primary test I do. I do whole genome sequencing in everybody, and then based upon the results of that, I can order other testing um, that's appropriate to identify or which ones are the, the important variants um, and where to go from there. Um, which doctor to do that would be somebody that's really familiar with taking um, genomic sequencing and to, and to make diagnoses and treatment plans based on that. There's, only, there's not that many people that can do that. Most of them are geneticists, but increasingly a lot of them are in other fields. I work with some neurologists that are really good at doing that. I've worked with people in other fields as well. So it's really, I would say, is that it's a physician that is comfortable with working with genomic information and is comfortable with working with somebody in genomics. Um, so I, I, I wanna, I'm sorry, I want to follow up with you because, you know, genetic testing now, I mean, we have all of these wonderful tests that we didn't have 25 years ago. So can you talk a little bit about the field and how it's evolved? I mean, right now, it, it seems amazing for patient families. Um, we have capabilities we didn't have three years ago, mostly on the technical side. Um, it's been maybe 10 years or so that we could do a whole genome sequence, but to take that and to understand it and to make use of it in a patient was extremely difficult. Now with the um, websites that are available and the technological advantages, we can now take a whole genome sequence and, and convert it into something clinically useful very quickly. Um, whole genome, by the way, is all of the genes. Um, plus everything in between the genes. So it's really, except for a couple areas that are highly repetitive, it's really doing all 3 billion nucleotide pairs that you get from the mother and from the father. Um, just 10 years ago or so, it, was, it went to panel testing and the panels increased from 10 to 100 and then eventually to 1,000. Now we do, then it was whole exome a few years ago, 23,000 genes, and now we can do um, whole genome. So, it's really made a huge difference. The amount of area that's, that we can sequence is over a, a million times, which was done just a little bit more than a decade ago for the same price. And the price has come down. I mean, it, it used to be incredibly expensive at one point. It was really expensive. It cost something like $30,000 to do maybe a, a few thousand genes. 
And now the price is, there are labs that will do whole genome sequencing for almost nothing, but the, the data is difficult to interpret. Um, the laboratories that are that do extremely good sequencing that sequence enough times to get good coverage and that the data that is released can be um, interpreted, it's in the neighborhood between one and three thousand dollars for the genomic sequencing. And that doesn't include interpretation costs and of course the cost for the physician. Dr. Kelly, can you tell our patients and families the importance of these genetic testings and how they relate to mitochondrial disease and why they're important? The, um, <clears throat> the, the if you, had, you think of mitochondrial, one has to think of mitochondrial disease in, in a broad spectrum. That is, there are classical mitochondrial diseases that can be identified by whole genome sequence and whole exome se sequencing. But it is still, um, uh, and then of course there's mitochondrial DNA testing, and I can't give you exact uh, per percentages, but most um, disorders these days are identified, if they can be identified, they're autosomal recessive disorders where both parents are carriers and the child is affected. And that's been the greatest increase in the past 10 years. It's been possible to make mitochondrial diagnoses by mitochondrial DNA, but now the exome sequencing allows many more diagnoses by uh, of disorders that have affect mitochondrial um, genes, that is genes that are involved in energy metabolism. There's also a large range of disorders that have uh, that disturb mitochondrial function in a clinically significant way. And they are also picked up by exome testing, but it's not, if you go to the literature and, and look at this diagnosis, it's not obvious that there is a, that a child who is thought to have signs of mitochondrial dysfunction and gets this diagnosis that is not recognized as mitochondrial it still could be. And that's where biochemical testing comes in. So if you have a, uh, a, a child with mitochondrial signs and a gene comes back and it says, it's a mitochondrial gene. First, you have to make sure that that gene fits the clinical history and the biochemistry. If it comes back as a gene that's equivocal and you're not sure what is, then one really needs the biochemical testing, which has lost its emphasis in, in recent years because of the power of exome sequencing. But it still is an extremely valuable way of making a diagnosis or showing that there's disturbance of mitochondrial function. And the other advantage of doing the best, modern, uh, best biochemical uh, testing is that that also tells you how to treat the disorder. The treatment is based much more on what one finds biochemically than on the uh, gene itself, although there are some, for example, uh, riboflavin responsive conditions where they find the gene will tell you to treat the riboflavin. So it's a combination of um, of the molecular testing, as they call it now, and the biochemical to help you test the validity of the finding and also identify a treatment. Dr. Scali, I want to come to you. Um, you know, we've got uh, all these genome and exome testing, and um, can you give your best opinion on, you know, a newly diagnosed or not even not even diagnosed yet? What would the best test be? to diagnose a patient? We still use, um, you know, in our practice uh, at Texas Children's Hospital, we still use um, whole exome sequencing, sort of like maybe like a first tier uh, um, approach. I mean, uh, um, uh, yes, there are, as was mentioned previously, that, does, that may not necessarily cover um, genetic letter changes that occur between the coding regions of the genes or in areas that really like regulate the genes and for and that would be covered with whole genome sequencing. Um, you know, one of the issues that obviously we all have to deal as physicians is dealing with insurance. And in many cases, I mean, if we see a child in the outpatient clinic, at least in our case at Texas General Hospital, or 
an adult at our adult mitochondrial clinic, we may not necessarily be able to order whole genome sequencing initially. So we will do whole exome sequencing. When a patient is in the hospital, it may be a different story. And we may have like more leeway and more leverage in terms of like ordering that particular test. But we still find, uh, I think I'll give you um, following up to what Dr. Kelly said, uh, we did have um, a case of a child that we saw at Texas General Hospital. The child had had regression. We ordered a critical um, trio uh, whole exome sequencing, and the child had was found to have a genetic defect um, encoding a riboflavin transporter. And treated with like higher doses of riboflavin, really that child regained by now most of his milestones. So doing that critical trio whole exome sequencing was able to provide us and provide the family, not only counseling, but guidance in terms of the treatment. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that too. Uh, the importance of genetic confirmation of a disorder cannot be underestimated. We also recently had a case of riboflavin uh, transporter deficiency, and this was a young woman who carried diagnosis of mitochondrial disorder, clinical diagnosis, or made on muscle biopsy for years. And then we did whole exome sequencing. We proved that she has uh, uh, riboflavin transporter deficiency, started her own uh, riboflavin, and she is doing much, much better. Even her hearing started coming back. And the same can be true about uh, thiamine transporter deficiency. We had these cases. So there are so many conditions tightly linked to mitochondrial disorders that are potentially treatable. And so this is very, very important to make a correct diagnosis. And going back to the point of biochemical testing, I also wanted to say biochemical testing, as it was mentioned before, is not going away. It's even more relevant now because I mean, if we think about variants of uncertain significance or variants of unknown significance, and I think that I can recall uh, the case of a child that by um, whole exome sequencing was found to have um, variants, actually two variants, one from mom, one from dad, of uncertain significance uh, in a gene that encodes a protein or produces a protein that is supposed to make complex two more available. Now that's all encoded by nuclear genome. So in that particular case, we did uh, I remember I did a skin biopsy, the skin cells were grown, and then we were able to assay complex two on these culture skin cells, and it was very deficient. And then we felt more reassured about the, the diagnosis, dealing specifically with genetic letter changes that we don't know, are they really disease causing? They have not been reported before. What do we do with this? So we need biochemical testing. Hmm. Interesting. Dr. Feigenbaum, I'm going to come to you with this next question because we get it a lot. Um, and it is the difference between primary and secondary mitochondrial disease. How do you know the difference? The short answer is sometimes we don't. Uh, but I think in 2021, with the genome sequencing and exome sequencing that we've been talking about, as well as don't forget uh, mitochondrial DNA sequencing. Um, primary mitochondrial diseases are defined primarily now by finding changes in the nuclear or the mitochondrial genome. Um, if we have disease causing mutations that we can correlate to the clinical picture or the biochemistry, I think what, we're all satisfied that there's a primary mitochondrial disease going on. Secondary mitochondrial diseases um, are very pleomorphic, multiple presentations, multiple causes, environmental factors, Parkinson's disease, cancer. We see mitochondrial dysfunction in many other genetic diseases. Uh, such as Angelman syndrome, which is a uh, nuclear gene defect um, that sometimes looks similar to mitochondrial diseases, but the primary cause is different. The importance of making the differential is treatment. Um, I think 
you know, all of us would be comfortable to treat a primary mitochondrial disease, and those patients would then be eligible for all the fascinating clinical trials that we've heard about over the last couple of days, and there are many of them, um, to try and find more specific therapies for mitochondrial diseases. As far as the secondary diseases are concerned, if there is biochemical disturbance that we can identify as others have brought up, we do use antioxidants, free radical scavengers, coenzyme Q or ubiquinol uh, to try and dampen down those secondary effects in the hopes that that would slow down uh, the, the damage that's done by the secondary uh, problems. But in addition, one has to treat the uh, underlying cause. Most of the patients that I have that have had a diagnosis of mitochondrial dysfunction due to biochemical or enzymatic testing have secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. When we do the whole genome sequencing, I'd say it's at least two to one, secondary to primary, probably higher now. Um, many of the genes, particularly the ion channelopathies, but also like the ubiquitization disorders like Angelman syndrome, um, neurotransmitter disorders, um, tr uh, transport disorders, as we said, but the riboflavin transporter. We also, I have also seen many of the creatine transporter. These are all outside of the mitochondria, the protein, but they have effects on energy metabolism. So they cause secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, many of those are actually autosomal dominant in inheritance or, or multifactorial inheritance as well, which isn't really as well characterized, particularly the channelopathies tend to be dominant. But whether the mitochondrial dysfunction is primary or secondary, it often responds to antioxidants and other parts of the so-called mitochondrial cocktail. Um, so while the primary diagnosis is really important because if we can find the exact cause, sometimes we can find a treatment that works incredibly well, like riboflavin transporter, creatine transporter, but also many of the channelopathies respond very well to potassium or to some other treatment such as a specific medication directed at that channel. But even if we can't find the cause or despite the cause, uh, many of them primary and secondary do respond to mitochondrial cocktail. I think another aspect in treatment is if it's a primary mitochondrial disease, many of those conditions are multisystemic. And so we have to continue monitoring and progressive over time or new symptoms can develop over time. So we have to continue monitoring the whole patient and not just the presenting organ system that's uh, made the diagnosis. Does that cover the question? I believe it does. Dr. Anselm, I'm coming to you next. Can you determine, or how can you determine um, supplements that a patient should take? I mean, are there tests for that? Or how, how would you make that determination? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we have, uh, and though it was published uh, several years ago, the sort of uh, consensus from Mitochondrial Medicine Society about the supplements that generally have to be used. But uh, also there was a, a paper prior to that uh, demonstrating that it's uh, very individual and in uh, different uh, specialists uh, that are involved in this mitochondrial medicine, they have their own uh, way to approach that. So this consensus was geared towards uh, uh, towards a sort of consensus of what to use. Now, I think we all agree that uh, coenzyme Q10 or ubiquinol uh, is probably needed uh, as a supplement to uh, all of our patients, especially those with primary CoQ10 deficiency when it's another treatable mitochondrial disorder and we follow families uh, with uh, this condition. Um, there, we also agree that uh, antioxidants uh, are necessary and uh, uh, generally we try to use not just one antioxidant but several because one antioxidant may act as pro-oxidants. So uh, we frequently use uh, um, lipoic acid, vitamin E, N-acetylcysteine. So that's probably uh, what the majority of our patients take. Now, there are some specifics to it. For example, it is known that patients with uh, uh, Crohn's syndrome, they uh, become deficient on 
folate in their brain. So they develop a brain folate deficiency. So these patients have to be treated or supplemented with folate. And we do it in the form of uh, folinic acid or leucovorin. Uh, patients with Paul G may also uh, develop uh, brain folate deficiency. And we do the same uh, with these patients. Now, uh, also some patients uh, we uh, treat with creatine. Yes, the same creatine that bodybuilders use uh, to build their muscles because it's been shown that uh, uh, in some cases, especially in cases of mitochondrial myopathies, when uh, uh, there is muscle wasting and weakness, creatine may be helpful in combination with exercise. So, um, some of these supplements are sort of universal for most of our patients, but we're trying to be creative and try to approach patients individually and uh, decide what's necessary, what's not necessary. Uh, for years, carnitine been used in patients with mitochondrial disorders and sometimes in uh, large doses. We're turning away from that. If, uh, patients uh, do not have uh, primary carnitine deficiency because it's been shown that uh, carnitine within higher doses could be uh, detrimental um, for, with prolonged use. Um, so that's uh, how we approach it. Uh, but I'd like to hear from other <laughs> doctors on this panel. Yeah, to follow up on what Dr. Anselm said, I think, you know, um, based on, I guess, one of the first trials that was done with these compounds by Dr. Tarnopolsky. He had used a combination of lipoic acid and coenzyme Q10 and creatine. So, you know, we, we may try that first ubiquinol, maybe not necessarily those three compounds at the same time, you know, first ubiquinol, see if the patient tolerates it, how is the response, and then progressively add um, lipoic acid and, um, and, and creatine. And, um, and I think also based on, there was a study published by Anu Suomalainen and her group in Finland last year about like uh, vitamin B3 or niacin deficiency in adults with mitochondrial myopathy. So, so in, in certain cases, you know, we have been trialing niacin, I mean, in our, um, in our patients. Um, uh, we also um, check vitamin D level in all of our patients. And uh, very frequently we find that uh, the levels are low and we supplement with vitamin D as well. I always check CoQ levels, vitamin D and carnitine levels in the blood with the idea to get them into the desired range um, to high enough, but also in the if carnitine, if the level's too high, then you would reduce the dose because of the potential long-term side effects that have already been discussed. Um, those that know me know that I'm very strongly believe in a cocktail of multiple compounds together for most people with mitochondrial dysfunction, because energy metabolism is like an assembly line and just giving vitamins to one guy in the assembly line, it's not going to make you more cards. It's going to give you chaos and that it's good to balance out instead of giving a huge amount of one thing and not enough of another. But I also, in my own practice, I also treat based on the genetics. We've already heard like if there's a problem with riboflavin or creatine or B3, that you can give huge amounts of that that's based upon the genetic defect. I have one that has an abnormality in the conversion of glutamate to glutamine um, and the other way. So I glutamine to glutamate, that goes mm -hmm. to alpha-ketoglutarate. She does incredibly well on very high doses of alpha-ketoglutarate. I never would have thought of that if it weren't for the genetics. But I also based on the phenotype, if you have migraine, um, riboflavin, CoQ, and magnesium are likely to be helpful. I mean, in, I can go on and on about different phenotypes, about certain ones that are often helpful. So it's complicated. It's, it's individualized. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, think... I agree. Oh, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. I just want to uh, add, and I agree with Richard uh, that uh, we have uh, individualized approach. I'm just thinking uh, about young children that frequently they cannot be on uh, on big amounts of compound or cocktails. So that's why uh, we generally start uh, with uh, one, two, three uh, supplements just to see how children would respond. For example, vitamin B2 is very hard for young children to tolerate. And uh, while some of our patients uh, have G-tubes and that uh, makes it a little easier for 
us to supplement these children, but uh, those kids who have to take these uh, cocktails by mouth, sometimes it's a struggle and it is difficult for them to take uh, uh, big amounts. Uh, so that's yeah. why we try to start with one or two supplements and then add additional ones if we see that uh, children tolerate these supplements. It's, it's and, and to follow up, sorry, sorry. It's a, it's a challenge in infant and toddler, hot toddlers. I agree entirely. Before school age, it's, it's different. You have to think about the dosage and the amount and everything. Um, riboflavin, vitamin E, and zinc, in my experience, are not that well tolerated. And sometimes carnitine at higher doses in the very young. So you have to think about that very carefully. One way is to do one at a time. Another one is to use a combination approach and start at a very, very small amount of combination and then work up. I think what I wanted to say is that, you know, regarding carnitine, you know, in, in the past, we were giving carnitine to all of our patients, but then we realized we have to tailor that effort. And I think that right now, I mean, if the carnitine level is normal, we do not supplement with carnitine. There have been few cases of uh, children with deletions, mitochondrial DNA deletions that have a renal tubulopathy and they lose carnitine in the urine. And in that case, the carnitine is low and we do supplement with carnitine at that time. I would, can I just bring up a couple of points about the vitamins? Uh, just to bear in mind to the parents that are listening, many of the vitamins are not uh, purity tested or don't have a, I don't know what it's called, NOC number. Um, please just speak to your doctors about which brand names or products that they would recommend rather than just buying anything over the counter. Uh, thank you. Agreed. I think you had, you wanted to weigh in. Hello, uh, I was going to add that um, that there really there is a specific role for each of the supplements that is, is used. The cocktails are put together in many different ways, but <clears throat> there are specific actions and reasons behind choosing most of what is used. For example, carnitine. If your carnitine is low, is normal, it's not. Carnitine can activate complex one, let's put it that way. It can, it can activate pyruvate dehydrogenase and activates co complex one. And in children who are sensitive to carnitine, raising the carnitine level by giving a supplement can cause a night and day change in the child's uh, behavior. The other thing is that the, um, uh, it was mentioned that vitamin E may not be that uh, important. I, one has to think of that uh, the natural system for detox for free radical capture in the mitochondrial inner membrane where most of the free radicals are produced is vitamin E serves as a primary um, capture of the free radical. It transfers it to coenzyme Q and then that is transferred to vitamin C and vitamin C is soluble and that detoxifies the um, inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, about 15 years ago, a study was published showing that giving more than 400 units of vitamin E a day was toxic or caused poor outcome in an adult study of atherosclerosis. The problem there was that they gave only vitamin E. Uh, there are 14 studies, and there's only one that gave vitamin C in addition uh, vitamin E by itself, many biochemists know, can become toxic. Any antioxidant as can become a pro-oxidant if given in, in excess. And that one has to give all three to achieve, to augment the natural system of detoxification. And the only times that I've had a patient who had been stable for many years regress um, was when um, was when we found there was a problem in the vitamin E. And so I have values before and after regression and something happened usually in the quality or the preparation of vitamin E and the regression could be explained. Restoring vitamin E stopped the regression. So it's very important to think of it from a physiological standpoint of how these things work. And it's just not a matter of uh, giving lots of antioxidant power. The other comment I will make is that with regard to tr treatment is that um, many mitochondrial problems, especially uh, things like Lee syndrome, Milos, the there are secondary um, amino acid deficiencies. 
that can be uh, more damaging than free radicals. One in particular is a problem, methionine, because methionine can be deficient in the whole body, but the blood level is normal due to various compensatory mechanisms. And in, in effect, in a disorder like Lee syndrome, the cells uh, consume themselves to make extra methionine. And you can see that in Lee syndrome by a rising MCV towards the end of their lives. And if you give methionine, it stops that. So I just wanted to uh, add some perspective from a perspective from a biochemist on how to design these cocktails. Uh, I agree with everything. I just want to add a couple of things. Um, you mentioned about the normal carnitine levels. I have found that many kids with normal carnitine levels on the lower side of the normal range, when you raise them to the higher side of the normal range, they do better. So when we're talking about the normal range, I think we have to be careful about that. And if as long as it's on the higher side of the normal range, it, you know, it's, and they don't have a carnitine smell, um, I suspect that that's probably safe and effective in them. And the other one is about vitamin E. Um, vitamin E is extremely important. That's true. It's just sometimes that small kids, they get nausea with that. And you have to be very careful with dosing, starting low, working up gradually. And some kids just don't tolerate very much, unfortunately. Well, definitely, if it's the carnitine is low normal, I'm in agreement that actually, you know, we would supplement in that case. But, you know, definitely not if it's like medium to upper range. So, yeah. I agree. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I understand that we have Dr. Senato back with us, so that's good news. But I want to stay on um, the Mito cocktail because we were getting some questions about that. And I know you were all talking about different supplements, but is the Mito cocktail the same in all patients? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's the same in all patients. No, uh, no. 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 And there are, there are some patients where we have seen um, even secondary pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. We have a case that was affecting a nuclear gene affecting complex one, NFU1. We measured pyruvate dehydrogenase. It was uh, deficient. This was done at uh, SIDEM. It was like a couple of three years ago now. And, you know, that child, obviously, we, we added with that thiamine. So we that helped to in a way, tailor the treatment. Uh, so yeah, definitely not. How, how would a patient or parent or caregiver know if their child is taking enough of a Mito cocktail? I, I will at least, what I do, um, the, one can measure vitamin E and vitamin and coke to 10 levels. And just over the many years I've been using them, I have found, uh, found, for example, for vitamin E, when my target range is between, is around 150% of the upper limit of normal. When it falls below that in a child who's, uh, who has a particularly unstable type of mitochondrial problem, then they will regress. So to have your vitamin E in the normal range is not adequate. And the same thing for CoQ10, though I have less experience or have less experience with regression from loss of, of that. That the, um, that the CoQ10 level, I shoot for 150% of the upper limit of normal. The bioavailability of both of them is, is highly variable, and that's why measuring levels is essential. And there is reason, just based on my clinical experience, there is reasonable correlation between the clinical effect and the blood level for both vitamin E and CoQ10, notwithstanding some arguments to the contrary in the literature. So at least for those, um, there I I, ha I personally have set set limits or set targets for treatment, and because of the bio, as I said the bioavailability is poor, those one has to measure. Vitamin C usually is in excess, um, or is given in excess, so that's not been a problem that I've seen. Uh, so that's so that's how one that's how I. Uh, identifying different needs or how much a particular patient needs. So I'll start out a particular common dose, usually measure the levels after three months. It takes three months to reach equilibrium, measure the levels at th three months and then adjust. 
Um, I use, I, I recommend only the Ubiquin All, the OL form of CoQ. It's about five times more bioavailable than Ubiquin Own, the common form that's over the counter, which also shows that a lot of the preparations that you'll buy just in a regular store are not necessarily good or even useful. The other thing is I agree entirely that high CoQ levels, you get better effects. I even go higher than 1.5. I like CoQ levels higher than four, between the four and seven range. Um, I deal a lot with children and young adults that have functional disorders, pain, fatigue, nausea, that's sort of my specialty. And in those cases, over and over again, normal or slightly high CoQ levels don't necessarily do the trick, but when the level hits mm -hmm. about three or four, often the patient feels better. Can I uh, ask the panel a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I have found that many times we get low plasma levels of CoQ, but when we measure leukocyte levels, they are higher and normal or above the normal range. Um, so I wondered what the practice was for the other panelists. As I said, I, I find good correlation between clinical effect and blood levels. I'm aware of the literature on on leukocytes, but then who's to say that leukocytes represent the total body level better than the blood? I don't, I don't know that data, so I don't know that there are such data. I, I use just plasma and serum levels as well. Um, I find that it, it really reflects how much the patient is taking and it shows compliance as well. And the teenager, you're not one, you're wondering if they're taking it or not, but everyone is a different bioavailability. Some you give 200 and the CoQ levels are sky high and you can reduce it. Other people are in a thousand and it's still the CoQ levels are on the lower side of the normal range. Um, the ones that require a lot more um, often are, have severe GI disease as you'd expect. I don't think it's a, a routine for all centers to follow the levels. I mean, we do uh, sometimes uh, check CoQ10 levels, but uh, uh, more so for either compliance or being worried about uh, over-the-counter supplements that uh, uh, may not contain a uh, good product. Uh, but uh, I don't know, Russ, do you follow CoQ10 levels? Or Fernanda, do you do that? We don't, Irina. I think we, yeah, we, we unless there is a concern about, right. uh, unless there is a concern about compliance, you know, exactly. like lack yeah. of compliance or, you know, or, or maybe a product that is being used that is not the one that we have recommended, but yeah. not routinely. I agree with Fernando. We, we don't get routine levels. Uh, sometimes there's, at least in our group, there is some correlation with serum versus leukocyte levels. In other patients, there doesn't seem to be any correlation. I haven't figured that one out yet. So we we uh, supplement and we get leukocyte levels. And if we're high normal, I think for the most part, I feel good about that. Okay, I wanna, I wanna move along. Dr. Senato, thank you for being able to join us. I wanna talk about a question when it comes to therapy both occupational and physical. So in a mitochondrial disease patient, is it more about building or saving muscle? Uh, I think you start with sustaining function and then building function. Uh, many mitochondrial patients, at least in our practice, are, are uh, sedentary. Uh, some of the kids are in wheelchairs. So we do what we can to uh, get them at least mobilized to decreased uh, loss of function. And uh, then we recommend uh, PT programs to help them gain function as best they can. I think it's individual. Everybody's a little bit different and there's no magic formula for everybody. You just have to work with the individuals with their PT and OT. How much therapy would, would and I'll toss this out to the panel, how much therapy would uh, would a general recommendation be? You know, we usually tell our patients to do it as tolerated. Some patients have a low tolerability because they haven't done much in a very long time. And some patients need more uh, just because they're a little bit more active. Uh, we like to stress the system a little bit from Mark Tonoplowski's data and uh, we think that exercise is very good and we think it's helpful for not only self-esteem, but as well as function. So we really push 
not say push our patients, no pun intended. We usually recommend to our patients that, you know, they follow up with PT. Uh, we'd like to, for them to get more than the usual amount of PT that they get in the school system. So many of our patients get private PT and OT. Uh, we have a very active rehab service here and we try to get them into rehab uh, so they can uh, mobilize and be individualized for their uh, rehabilitation needs. I can also bring up that uh, some of the families, and again, individualized, depending on the, the child or the person, uh, swimming and hippotherapy, horse riding, uh, yeah. often very helpful. Yeah, the water makes your body more buoyant. And so it takes less stress off a lot of things. Uh, with COVID, there's been a lack of pool therapy, but uh, many of our patients before COVID uh, were very active in that type of therapy. And most of them would relay back to us that it was very beneficial. Yeah. And I can, I mean, I can relate to that because many of our families have told us and have told me that, uh, you know, during COVID, you know, obviously less exposure to physical occupational therapy, kids less active. And, and in a way, they, they, that has had an impact on their motor development. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with uh, what was said already. And I just want to add that physical therapy is necessary, not just to build and save the muscle, but, you know, range of motions is very important too, because, you know, many of our patients, they don't move very much and they develop contractions in their joints that uh, ultimately may need surgery and so on. So I think from that standpoint, it is very important as well. <clears throat> I would add that it's if they have a motivated child and you can work with the trainer, that it's important to emphasize the um, isometric exercise. That is, one can increase the bulk of type two muscle almost infinitely. And that's not as dependent on the mitochondrial function as type one. And type one muscle is very hard to increase in, 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 in bulk, somewhat in strength. But really, if you're going to, I've found if you are going to get a child up and really active who has uh, been sedentary for a long time. It's the type two muscle that has to be exercised. I had one patient that had, had, had severe mitochondrial dysfunction from uh, LCHA deficiency. I started treating him and he was an adolescent who wanted to do an exercise program. So he worked with a trainer and worked with me. And what was very interesting is uh, he became quite physically capable of running and playing basketball, doing many things. And during his training, I was able to show that he, he transitioned or that he developed a, a huge rate of gluconeogenesis. Um, so he was eating extra protein and he was generating a lot of glucose through gluconeogenesis, which I could see was activated. And so he was running, he was he was uh, making a lot, he was running his muscle on glucose um, by increasing the amount of type two muscle. It, that is also the way that children with bar syndrome where they have essentially no functional, no decent type one muscle. And if they exercise and increase type two muscle, they're basically running off of glucose. They, they need increased gluconeogenesis. If one measures oxygen extraction over a muscle bed, it's virtually zero. So they uh, do it, doing um, uh, endurance training is not, is not helpful for them. In fact, it makes them worse if you uh, put, put them on a bicycle. Uh, so you, one needs to do isometric training and is best done with the trainer. I, I wanna move on to another question that, that is um, dealing with siblings. Dr. Anselm, I'm gonna ask you this question. If a sibling is not showing signs of mitochondrial disease, should they get genetic testing? And, and I, I offer that to the panel as well. Well, uh, that uh, million dollar question. <laughs> you know that there is a very strong recommendation from genetic society not to test uh, siblings if a uh, finding is not actionable. So let's think about mitochondrial disorder. If a child has, let's say, um, uh, the patient is diagnosed with MILAS and then there is a sibling and uh, mother is a carrier of the mutation. So is it 
worth testing a sibling? And I don't think that there is a definite question uh, answer to that. If this sibling is an adult and does not show any evidence of the disease, so maybe this person is probably is a carrier of the mutation, but uh, uh, whether this person has to be tested or not is also individual. If this is a woman, then she, a uh, young woman, she can pass this mutation to um, to her children. So I generally recommend testing. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, some families, they don't, they want the, their other children who are not affected to be tested and some don't. But uh, let's imagine that there is a young child who you find is a carrier of a uh, Mila's mutation, that's, uh, and this looks like this child is unaffected, but the mutation is at high level, like high heteroplasmy. Should this child be placed on uh, arginine supplementation or on mitochondrial cocktail? I think it's a question to Dr. Scalia, uh, too, about arginine. So um, I would say that uh, I think uh, in general, uh, patients who have uh, the families who have one child affected and they're uh, wondering about their other children, uh, they should be offered testing, uh, but then they should decide on their uh, own whether it is worth doing that uh, or not. And I really want to hear from other sure. uh, providers how they approach this. Can I give you an example? I, I love your explanation. It was beautiful. Uh, I was on the team looking for the Huntington gene, and I was working with Nancy Wexler when I was at UCLA. And as you know, her mother died of Huntington's disease, and she had that cohort in Brazil, and they actually cloned the gene. And once uh, the Harvard people cloned the gene, uh, we had our last meeting of this little group, and she was asked, do you want to know what the, if you carry the gene? And she was about 45 at that point. And she said, no, she goes, I live my life as if it's my last day and this disease has made me do that. And I don't wanna lose that. So I think some of it is individual choice if people are old and cognizant enough to make that choice for themselves. But I understand your point. I mean, I, I'm always recommending gene testing just because I wanna know, you know, but sometimes it's more for me than for the family when I think about it. But I also I think, think that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I just want to finish my thought, is also that if you diagnose uh, the child who does not uh, show any signs of the disease and that uh, you diagnose this child as being a carrier or uh, having uh, two mutations, being compound heterozygote, but not showing any symptoms, at least as of yet, you would probably change your approach. You would follow hearing in this child. You would do EKGs in this child. So I think uh, in many ways it's uh, actionable, but uh, many times, especially in the past, I had to argue with insurance companies about this testing uh, and they would say why would you need to test this child uh, who who is healthy at the moment so there are arguments pro and con I've, i actually found in, interestingly with, with some other conditions that i followed that uh, even a child who is seven years old has to give a consent it's called assent for testing can you imagine like seven year old and the, this child sees that his or her sibling is severely ill affected and uh, that's what is uh, required and that's what genetics uh, society recommendation is and uh, but thinking about mitochondrial disorders i think that in general uh while we do not have definite cures and treatments but still findings are actionable in a way of uh, how we follow these uh, siblings and so i always recommend testing and i think it depends it may depend whether you know we are dealing with a let's say mitochondrial dna mutation versus like a nuclear gene like if we know that there is a a child that is affected with like nuclear gene defect and we know that it's like early onset but we are seeing like a much like older sibling who is seemingly healthy and unaffected then obviously and that person is still a minor then obviously there is the ethical concern of like 
asymptomatic testing of a of a minor, right? But I agree, if we are dealing with a mitochondrial DNA mutation, and then uh, uh, there are like different degrees of heteroplasmy, and maybe that person is not symptomatic yet, doesn't mean that she or he will not become uh, symptomatic, then I agree that maybe like, like you stated, Irina, that the, 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 the testing, if the testing is positive, you could at least start with doing some screening you know, and uh, and be prepared, right? Yeah. Well, this is, um, I agree with everything that people have said. I mean, basically it goes into two categories, consent and actionability. In the consent, you want to make sure that the family really understands the implications involved. And it was mentioned about the assent. Some seven-year-olds are really sophisticated. They know exactly what their brother or sister has, and they know if they want to know or not. I've had ones come up to me before and say, I, I, I want to find out that I don't have it so I don't have to take this cocktail stuff anymore. Though, because <laughs> if it were negative, then you, know, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, the other thing is this, is some um, actionability. Um, if you gave cocktail early, might you delay symptoms in somebody that you knew had the genetic abnormality? I and mean, we don't have an answer to that, but I think most of us would think that it might. The other scenario I can think of is that sometimes we get a report on, uh, let's say, mitochondrial DNA sequencing, and there is a report that there is a such and such variant, but it's not clear whether this is disease causing or not. So uh, at least it was not reported before and cannot be found in uh, databases. So then we uh, test siblings to see if unaffected siblings have a uh, same variant with the uh, same level of heteroplasmy or even higher levels of heteroplasmy. Again, this is not a hundred percent answer as to whether this uh, variant is disease causing, but it makes us think that maybe this is uh, uh, not the culprit and not a cause of the disease if the un unaffected sibling has the same variant with the uh, high heteroplasmy level. Great. It certainly can be helpful Great. in the situation to knock it out as being causal, meaning the only cause of the disease that an unaffected sibling has the same mutation. And, but it, of course, doesn't rule out the fact that it might be polygenic or a risk factor involved with yeah. many other things. But yeah, I do that as well to look at variants and to say, OK, I don't know if this is related to the disease or not, but it's not the sole cause or likely not. Great discussion. So I want to I want to continue on with treatments um, for for patients, and I'm going to toss this out to the entire panel because a lot of questions come in surrounding this next question. And if I could get from all of you, what is your best recommendation for care if a patient does not have access to a mito doc? So maybe I can start. Sure. Um, I think I think the the horizon has shifted a lot uh, thanks to COVID, and hopefully will continue. So even if you don't have personal access to a mito doc with telemedicine, we can now uh, contribute a lot to the care of these patients across the world. Um, so hopefully that will improve things. I think. Uh, one of the challenges is getting all the information on those patients. And so I often leave it up to the parents to assemble all the records and send it to me so that I can review in advance or after the first meeting, if I really feel that the child has a mitochondrial disease specifically, and then make recommendations after that. Well, I agree entirely. I'm fully telemedicine now, and I don't expect that that's going to change. I'm geographical. There's no barriers anymore, hopefully. But financial, some people can't afford it. Their insurances won't cover it. We still have financial barriers, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, interesting, in the Northwest, we serve a five-state region. And uh, I have patients in Wyoming and Montana and Alaska. And uh, fortunately, up until, well, until tomorrow, I have telemedicine privileges in all those places. It ends on the 30th. But uh, I, I take care of patients in Guam and Hawaii, and I take care of a patient in the Netherlands. And although they have good health care in the Netherlands, I'm not demeaning the Netherlands at all, but 
I met the mother and the mother likes me for some reason. And so what I do is I deal with the PCP, whether it's a, an adult internist or a pediatrician, and I communicate with him and he communicates with me. I don't get any reimbursement, but uh, I feel it's sort of my, uh, my calling to, to help out. And so I do a lot of medicine through the PCP and that's worked pretty well. I don't have a huge population. I probably couldn't do that. But like Annette was saying, well, I'm really hopeful for telemedicine, but we're getting a lot of pushback from our institute because of reimbursement and telemedicine and who knows what will happen, but at least it's, you know, Pandora's out of the box and hopefully we'll be able to use it to our benefit. Yeah, I agree with what has been said. I think that now telemedicine is here to stay. We are restricted to just do telemedicine in the state of, of Texas, but that has really allowed even for follow-up patients and for, for their families to really like stay in El Paso, San Antonio, Fort Worth, rather than having this like long drive or, you know, or Air, airplane ride to, to Houston. So, uh, and that has been very beneficial for these children. Yeah. And the yeah. look, all the gear around. Don't you think, Fernando? The, the, the ventilator, yeah. the huge wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. the stuff for the TPN or for the, the G2 feeding. And yeah, we see, I see that a lot. And, you know, my heart just goes out to these families because they're willing to do that. But yeah. now we can make it easier. So. Our kids with autism or cyclic vomiting syndrome, there's a lot of reasons why people have a difficult traveling. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, telemedicine, I'm really hoping is here to stay. Yeah, we, we just did a briefing on Capitol Hill about a week ago about it. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear you say, all of you who see patients, how important it is because it really knocks down barriers. State licensure is a major problem. And now with COVID, I can do it nationwide, but that's going to go away soon. I have privileges and I mean, license in five different states. It's an extreme amount of time and money and effort to do that. I have to follow the laws in all the states. I have to do the CME in all the states. I have to pay the thousands of dollars for every state. Um, I mean, I'd like to extend it, but um, to a few more states and I probably will, but to go to a situation where I do 50 states, is just not possible unless the laws changes. So I wanna ask if a patient has mild symptoms and Dr. Feigenbaum, I'm gonna ask you this question and the parent or caregiver is on a wait list to see a mito doc. What preparations, and, and feel free panel if you wanna weigh in on this, what preparations should be made prior to seeing the doctor or should the parent or caregiver start supplements or wait to see the doctor? So I think I'll answer the second one first and if there are mild symptoms and no family history of more severe symptoms, I would ask that they delay starting the supplements because it may affect our testing. If we assume the supplements actually help, um, we should see that on some of our biochemical testing. Of course, it won't change the genetic testing, but the biochemical testing, it, would, it might. Um, as far as preparation is concerned, well, I go back to the telemedicine. Hopefully that will reduce the wait times uh, for all these families if we can get them onto telemedicine, at least to do an initial assessment. Uh, the preparation, making your binders and CDs and getting all the information together, preferably in chronological order with the clinical notes and all the labs. I know, you know I, I speak for myself, but I'm a little obsessive about getting all the information um, and many of these patients and families have been to multiple centers and got multiple opinions um, MRI scans on CD because the report is often by adult neuroradiologists not pediatric and the interpretation can be a little different um, lists of your medications and doses and preparations brand names all those kind of things we like, I like uh, to try and review ahead of time. Does that cover that? Now I let's yeah, see Dr. Anselm, would you like would you like to weigh in on that? Well, I agree with everything that was said, and uh, we always try to get records ahead of time, especially in the past when patients had to 
travel to us and uh, some of these uh, kids been to many centers already and we just see that uh, you know unfortunately we cannot solve the issue like even if the child travels to us and it's not that we are opposed to seeing this child but we just want to save uh, uh, time and money to the family on the other hand uh, uh, we really want to know what's been done already so that we can be prepared for if the child uh, comes from uh, uh, other states, should we just plan on getting genetic testing? Should we get uh, genetic counsel on board to consent the family so that the family does? Should we uh, also uh, plan on this child to see some other specialists like gastroenterologists or do some uh, cardiologists? So um, having records ahead of time uh, in a patient who is coming from uh, afar, it's extremely, extremely important because if uh, families come from uh, our, from Massachusetts for us or from New England, we know that the travel is not uh, uh, that difficult, uh, or of course, still difficult for some of these kids uh, who uh, ventilated or so on. Uh, but uh, uh, especially for patients coming from uh, other states. So I think it's very important. I think that uh, some families think that we are able to view uh, MRIs uh, through uh, special systems connecting us to other hospitals and uh, uh, th there are such systems so it's not necessarily that MRIs have to be brought uh, on uh, CDs but it's not a guarantee so it's better to have MRI uh, on the disc so that we can review with our radiologist if we cannot get MRI ahead of time and we of course uh, very important for us to uh, have uh, reports on the genetic testing if, if it was uh, already done so that we don't reinvent uh, the will and don't repeat uh, genetic testing uh, and the insurance may not cover it. Yeah. I do want to bring up, I, I, I didn't discriminate between a patient who does not have a, diagno a specific diagnosis versus one that's already got a specific diagnosis. That's a different ball game. So if you do have your DNA results and you know your diagnosis and now you want to see a MIDO expert, please put that front and center that uh, then we yeah. know exactly what we need to do. Um, I also uh, want the families to know about the new things that UMDF is doing um, and go to the website because there is genetic testing coming up that may help us uh, be available. And maybe we can even get that done before you come to the Mundo Expert. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about lab tests. Dr. Kelly, parents get worried when lab results show results out of range, high or low, and on lab work, there could be red flags. So. When a parent, and we all have portals now, we can look at lab test results on our own, even though we can't make sense of it. Um, what red flags should a parent be looking for in a, a, a lab test result? I think that unfortunately is patient dependent. Uh, obviously people are concerned about lactate, but certain mitochondrial problems like A and T transporter deficiency, a child can be perfectly well with a lactate of 10 millimole. So it, uh, it depends on, it's really more what is changing. Um, and as a parent learns more about their child's diagnosis and what abnormalities to, to look for is, um, that, that will determine what the red flags are. I, I um, <clears throat> A couple of things to mention that I, I think parents, I, I always explain to parents that the, 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 the normal range as given by a laboratory has, has many flaws, first of all, from a clinical standpoint. First of all, the normal range is quite arbitrary in most, uh, it, it is arbitrarily set at, um, at, at, uh, at plus or minus two standard deviations, whereas in most cases, plus or minus three standard deviations is physiologically normal. So many low values and many high values, if they're not very different from the normal range, they're probably normal. But again, the parent will learn what's important and what is not. Um, 
another area that um, is, is uh, often misunderstood is changes in the uh, liver function test, the, the ALT and the AST. Um, it, is, it can be a sign of uh, mitochondrial disease affecting the liver, but uh, in many mitochondrial disorders, a high ALT Oh, and, and the ALT will often fluctuate because of uh, lipid storage, fat storage, which will go up and down with diet. Again, any trend that a parent sees um, or a physician sees uh, is more important than an absolute value. And it's always good to repeat a test because lab error does occur. Um, the, I also find that the Physicians, like everyone else, vary in how much time they have and how much they can focus on the laboratory tests. And it is, uh, it is because the trends are important and because often a, a child will go to a clinic and see different doctors, parents have to learn how to uh, track their child's laboratory values. And uh, there's no general text that they, they can read, but they have to become as informed about the child's disease as the, um, from a management standpoint, uh, the, as the physician is. And the parent of course has, is dealing with the child every single day and can correlate uh, clinical changes with laboratory changes. So it's, I can't say that there's any one specific flag. Um, one thing that um, in, in terms of what is normal, the other, factor, the uh, other problem occurs sometimes in other, and we see this in mitochondrial disease, that uh, vitamin B12, for example, serves as an antioxidant. And if the antioxidant um, control is not good, vitamin D level will go down. But it is quite possible to have a, a quote unquote normal vitamin D level within the normal range, let's say 300, and yet a child have functional vitamin D deficiency or vitamin uh, B12 deficiency. I should also mention that vitamin B, a vitamin D deficiency can also be a sign of inadequate antioxidant protection because both uh, vitamin B12 and vitamin D serve as antioxidants. So if the, anti if the free radical load is high, vitamin D and vitamin B12 can go down. But one has to recognize that for certain tests, in particular vitamin B12, the normal range is, um, there is tremendous variation in the, in the individual person's natural vitamin B12 level. Uh, so again, one can have a low, have a normal level and still have functional vitamin B12 deficiency. The, um, I, I think that those are the main points that uh, I was going to make with that. The, the, um, the last, actually the last thing I would say is with regard to amino acids. Um, well, I was, I, which I have done for many years, I ran the amino acid lab at Hopkins. The, um, the, the optimal time for collecting amino acids is at five hours fasting after a, a meal. The obtaining amino acids after overnight fasting in a child is almost worthless. It might show something abnormal, but it, it'll give you false abnormalities because especially in a child, Overnight fasting, or at the time that a child goes to the laboratory, they are switching from gluconeogenesis, or they may have activated gluconeogenesis, and then they're switching over from that to fatty acid oxidation, and amino acid levels are going all over the place. And I've seen morning fasting samples that look just like the postprandial sample. So the time, to time it, you cannot do overnight fasting and get an accurate, you, you can't you can correlate that with the nutritional status of the child. And I find that five hours, four to five hours fasting, four hours for a young child, five hours fasting for an adult, brings the amino acids to a uh, level, to levels that correlate best with the underlying mitochondrial function. Uh, and the other thing is that, again, for amino acids, there's a problem that the normal range is given by some laboratories make no sense. Uh, and because they, they are standardized, their controls are based on overnight fasting. 
so that uh, you they may say an alanine level of uh, of 600 is, is normal. Uh, I've seen in some labs, whereas it's if you look at it relative to other amino acids, it's clearly abnormal. So I would uh, to to the panel and to others, I would encourage making five hours fasting standard for amino acids. It does sometimes require a second blood sample if one has to measure lipid levels, but even lipid levels usually are pretty reliable at five hours fasting. Most laboratory values that I measure, I, I do almost everything at five hours um, and uh, the data are in interpretable. So I think I've said enough about testing. So Dr. Sinedo and, and panel, feel free to weigh in on this next question. Uh, a parent has asked that uh, when a child reaches puberty, is disease progression typical? Uh, you know, <clears throat> at least in our practice, uh, the puberty process is a stressor and it can really change uh, some of the findings that we see in not only mitochondrial disease, but in neurological disorders in general, and in particularly in epilepsy. Uh, that may not be true across the board, but when you look at some of the data coming out, for instance, from uh, Finland, that puberty seems to be a trigger for pole gamma in some patients for that disease to be expressed. Uh, I don't think it happens in everybody, but I'm, I'm I'm always leery when puberty starts. And my questions are, have you started puberty yet? And how long are you through? And uh, I can look at the, usually it's the mom that brings the child in, in our clinic. So I can look at the mom, she looks pretty harried. I know that her 13 year old daughter is in the midst of puberty and she's trying to learn to adapt. But uh, I, I think it does put a stressor on the body and mitochondrial disease is related to stress. So I think it can have a, uh, a problem in some patients. You just have to gauge it by the particular patient you're seeing though at the time. Yeah, and I agree. And we've seen it mostly in Paul G related disorders that actually yeah. like after the onset of puberty, in particular, like the neurological features have worsened. Yep. I think in most cases, there's not progression per se, but it's just whatever symptoms the child has are exacerbated yeah. during puberty. And then after puberty goes onto the other side, it goes away again. So I try to do anticipatory guidance for somebody who's like a child was 10 or 11. They're going for puberty earlier and earlier. Symptoms are likely to get worse as puberty approaches. And we have to be very careful with dosing because not only will symptoms get worse, but they're going to be growing really fast and we can get behind on drug and supplement dosing. But puberty is a, um, a limited disease. It goes away in all cases. You got to hope. I think, uh, you know, we've mentioned that it's the neurological side that probably worsens or exacerbates most. Remember that some patients with mitochondrial disease may not have neurological symptoms. So that may not be always the case with puberty that it gets worse or shows worse. Well, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, I find in particular, a lot of the non-neurological ones can get worse during puberty. It's just, it's, it's a stressor. It stresses the whole body. It stresses the mind. I mean, if anyone remembers their own puberty, it's, it's, it's a stressor. And so if there'll be about a two year period or so in which patients will often have a little bit worse symptoms, but it goes away. If there's a movement disorder, it'll typically get worse during puberty. And I, I always warn parents ahead of time. And then as Dr. Bull says, it typically movement disorder goes back to where it was before puberty. It's actually mysterious. I've looked at it metabolically and it's, it's really hard to, it's, it's I don't see evidence of metabolic stress with regard to the mitochondria. So I, I still think of it as a mysterious process. For example, uh, one has to think of the fact that one of the common times for new onset seizures or transient seizures is puberty. A child who's perfectly well can have their one and only seizure during puberty. So there, it is a, a period of instability, I guess one would say in the nervous system, but it um, progression for something like PolyG may be possible, but in general, the symptoms will go back to baseline after puberty. 
So we have about five minutes left in this session. Dr. Feigenbaum, I'm gonna start uh, this next question with you. And, and of course the panel is always welcome to weigh in, but with a baby that has mitochondrial disease, what does long-term care look like? Okay, so it depends on the severity of the disease clearly, but if we've diagnosed a baby because of symptoms, uh, one would assume that it's on the more severe side of problems, um, often neurological, but could be cardiac or kidney, liver, depends on the, uh, the underlying cause and diagnosis. So I think the care depends on the symptoms um, and the rapidity of the progression of disease or other complications, but care unfortunately for many families it is a 24 seven process. I don't know if that was where the question was aimed at, um, but many families need nursing care at home, uh, extra equipment, whether it's ventilator or G-tube, uh, seizure control, a multidisciplinary team. So I think the biggest struggle that families have is to find their medical home. Who's going to be your point person? And do you have an advocate to help you with that as well? Um, these are complicated diseases. We sometimes have to tell families we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And so you can't really prepare uh, for the future. One has to take day by day and treat the symptoms as they occur and always keep your mind open to are there any new experimental therapies or ideas out there the, the field is changing rapidly um, but general pediatric care is complicated so an excellent i'm not even going to say good an excellent pediatrician who's comfortable with chronic care um, would be a big person to have on your team and if you do have a biochemical geneticist who can be the point person and maybe summarize for all the other subspecialists, cardiologists, the nephrologist, depending on what is needed, what to look out for and what to look for um, is an important aspect as well. I, yeah. agree entire, sorry. I agree entirely. I just want to mention that I have a lot of patients who are diagnosed with babies that are much older now and doing very well. Um, that while some of the kids that are diagnosed as babies, particularly if they're very severe as babies, um, they may be severe, but I have several that are on treatment and doing very well, even though they were diagnosed as babies. So it's, it, it's extremely variable. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I so agree. With I, the, I don't with your... want, I don't want to send the message. I'm sorry. Can I just, okay. Uh, the <laughs> message if you're severe as a baby, doesn't mean you're going to be severe for life. Um, you know, birth and delivery is a major stressor uh, yeah. to both the baby and the mother. And so kids can present in the ICU in the first days of life. Uh, that does not predict what the future will necessarily hold. So yeah, I agree. Uh, some of our patients, they surprise us uh, so much, like uh, even being affected as uh, babies. But I think that Annette uh, raised a very important point of who is going to be the, your like a primary care physician, not the primary care physician, but the physician who will take care of all necessary referrals and so on. And uh, uh, my experience, at least in our state, that generally these are not uh, pediatricians. So either us who run these mitochondrial programs or in some hospitals, there are some uh, special uh, programs like in our hospitals called complex care uh, program where pediatricians in the hospital overview the care for these children. Uh, but again, we cannot predict for what's going to happen with uh, our patients in the future. They definitely sometimes surprise us. I fully agree. In our pediatric mitochondrial clinic, we, we establish a good rapport with complex care pediatrics within the Texas Children's Hospital, because as, as you said, Irina and Annette, I mean, there's, it, it's, it, this is very complex. It cannot just be managed by a regular pediatrician, but we end up as geneticists and neurologists in our team, coordinating the care and also bringing uh, palliative care, which that doesn't necessarily mean 
end of life care. I'm not trying to to you know to make it sound that way, but it offers um, a respite to this to these families. Yeah, yeah, because you know, like like you all said, some of these children may seem very severe, but they may live up longer. So yeah. Thank you, panel. We are we are out of time for this Ask the Mito Doc session. Thank you for sharing your time and answering these questions from our patient families. And for those of you who are with us right now, we'll be taking a short break and invite you to join the upcoming sessions at the top of the hour.